Hello everyone and welcome to round one of the 1972 uh, match of the century between uh, Boris Vasilyevich Spassky and Robert James Fisher. Uh, although it could have easily been uh, the 1972 match of the century in uh, Belgrade and Reykjavik, but we're going to talk about that uh, a bit more uh, after we cover some of the basics. Uh, so if you remember and if you've been uh, enjoying the Fisher series so far, uh, we've covered the Palma de Mallorca Interzonal Tournament and if you remember Fisher didn't even qualify for the Palma de Mallorca Interzonal zonal tournament because he didn't play the US championship that was kind of uh, a requirement uh, to qualify for the interzonal tournament uh, but he pretty much crushed the field there then he continued the, to the candidates matches where he uh, well, let's say uh, destroyed Mark Taimanov, uh, Bent Larsen, and uh, former world champion Tigran Petrosian, uh, uh, two of the uh, two of the previous ones, uh, with a result of six to zero, and then Tigran Petrosian with a result of six and a half to two and a half, uh, which. Um, uh, which qualified him, uh, gave him this uh, opportunity to challenge Boris Vasilyevich Spassky for the title. Now, Fischer and Spassky played uh, five games before their encounter in Reykjavik, and uh, uh, from those five games, Fischer didn't win a single one. Uh, Spassky won three, and f and uh, two of the games were drawn. Uh, but before the match in Reykjavik could uh, even happen, uh, a lot of conditions uh, would have to be met by both sides. Uh, for example, immediately after this um, match with Petrosian was over in Buenos Aires, uh, the the venue of the match of the century had to be decided. Where will the match be played? And uh, Fischer said that um, he didn't really enjoy the way uh, Soviets uh, treated this whole situation. For example, after Fischer's match with Tigran Petrosian uh, in in the uh, Russian newspapers. Uh, and they didn't really cover this news uh, uh, th that greatly. For example, there was like this little article uh, about uh, Fisher's uh, great victory over Tigran Petrosian, and then there was this, uh, for example, local tournament uh, in, in Russia that uh, uh, that was given the headline. Uh, but uh, if, for example, Tigran Petrosian had won his match against Fischer, then it would be uh, the headline in all the newspapers. And uh, Fischer had uh, a lot of similar stories. For example, he said that um, uh, if he was uh, to play an international tournament and he, uh, he required uh, the tournament organizers to pay Fischer, for example, $1,000 or, or even $2,000, uh, that the Soviets would send uh, their strong grandmasters to play there for free, uh, so Fischer wouldn't get uh, any, any uh, media presence. Uh, and the list, of course, goes on. So uh, now that they had to decide where to play the match, uh, it was uh, very interesting. The Soviets uh, first uh, out of the 12 possible options, because 12 organizers applied, uh, the Soviets uh, agreed to, to four of them as uh, even uh, uh, worth uh, considering. Uh, in order of likelihood to happen, it was uh, number one Reykjavik, uh, number two Amsterdam, number three Dortmund, and number four Paris. And uh, Fischer didn't really uh, like those four options. Uh, well, first of all, Fischer also uh, had to keep an eye on the prize fund. Uh, the prize fund in Reykjavik was $125,000, and uh, Fischer would uh, much prefer the prize fund uh, in Belgrade, which was uh, something like 150 something, I believe, $156,000. So although Fischer would prefer to play the match of the century in, uh, in, uh, for example, Belgrade or Sarajevo uh, or uh, even Buenos Aires. I, I think Fischer preferred playing in Buenos Aires the most, uh, but they simply didn't offer enough uh, money for the prize fund. Uh, so then, uh, and uh, there is also this other thing. Fischer did not want to agree to any of the terms uh, Spassky and the Soviets offered. Uh, for example, he refused all of the four. Uh, cities the Soviets offered, uh, n not so much just because of the price fund, but uh, he also didn't want to uh, concede to any terms by the Soviets. Uh, and uh, he also said that uh, the Soviets uh, play way worse when they are <laughs> on the other side of the Atlantic, so uh, of course he wanted Spassky to come to him. And uh, Spassky said that uh, all of the matches, uh, you know, during the candidates' matches uh, were played uh, pretty much where Fischer wanted the, them to be played, so he didn't want to uh, be fooled by that. Uh, so that being said, uh, they couldn't really agree where the match of the century will be played. Uh, so uh, the president of FIDE, Dr. Max Juve, uh, decided that it will be played, the first half of the match will be played in Belgrade, so 12 uh, games in Belgrade, and then the other 12 games or or less, if uh, you know the match perhaps will not last for 24 games, uh, will be played in Reykjavik. And uh, uh, Fischer didn't really enjoy this decision by, by FIDE president, and Spassky didn't like it either. Uh, 
and Spassky uh, already felt cheated because he said, okay, uh, I mean, I'm the world champion and now you give Fischer uh, his terms, his 12 games in Belgrade, but the match might not last 24 games, uh, so he will get more games in Belgrade than I will get in Reykjavik, for example. Uh, but uh, Spassky didn't uh, disagree with the decision, but on the other hand, Fisher did. Fisher said that uh, this was a no-go and <laughs> that he does not uh, agree uh, to play under such terms, uh, you know, moving uh, from here to there. Uh, it's uh, just not fitting for such a match. Uh, but then, as uh, FIDE president, uh, Dr. Uwe, could not come to a decision how to solve this, he gave Fischer an ultimatum. Uh, he told Fischer that either he will play uh, first half in Belgrade, second uh, half in Reykjavik, uh, or that the match is off and that there will be another match, a World Chess Championship match, that will be uh, 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 Boris Paski versus Tigran Petros, and that will be played in Moscow. So here, Fischer didn't really have any choice. He had to agree to these terms. Uh, and he did uh, agree to these terms, uh, but uh, then after you know other arrangements were to be made, uh, Fisher started making a lot of a lot of uh, uh, different complaints. For example, he uh, he wanted uh, di different chairs to be played, uh, uh, you know, for them to be seated in during the match, a different lighting, different contrast of the pieces and the board, uh, different everything. But most of all, he demanded more money. Uh, such uh, One such example is uh, he demanded that the players get 30% of the gate money. Uh, and uh, none of the organizers uh, would, uh, would comply to those rules as... Uh, it's simply too much money, and the, the organizers do organize these events. I mean, they do like chess, but mostly they do it for the money. Uh, and uh, Fisher said, I mean, if, if uh, Clay can, uh, you know, ask for such terms, why couldn't I? Why is chess so different than boxing? Uh, uh, talking about uh, the match between Muhammad Ali. And... Uh, of course, uh, organizers in Belgrade could not comply to this, and they decided to back out. So now only Reykjavik was left, and uh, Fischer said that uh, uh, he still does not uh, agree to those terms, uh, but uh, Russian Chess Federation and Spassky said that uh, you know the, the, the terms have been agreed upon and that the match will be he held in Reykjavik. Uh, if Fischer wants to play, uh, Fischer will come to Reykjavik. And so it was uh, already... Uh, almost time to play there were uh, it was like one day and uh, when the match should start uh, the opening ceremony started the Fischer of course was not uh, on the opening ceremony in Reykjavik only Spassky was there Fischer was still in New York and uh, uh, here there was a, a bit of a uh, controversial decision by FIDE president Max Juve. Uh, he decided to postpone uh, the beginning of the match uh, by two days. Uh, so uh, he uh, took it upon himself to give Fischer more, more time to reconsider and uh, to come play this uh, match of the century. Uh, and that wouldn't really impress Fischer all that much, uh, but it was actually... It was actually British chess promoter Jim Slater. You have a quote above the board by Mr. Jim Slater. Uh, if money is the question, here it is, and I'll come out and play you chicken. Uh, this is what he said to Fisher, and uh, on top of the $125,000 prize fund that, uh, that the organizers in Reykjavik offered, uh, Mr. Jim Slater also offered £50,000, which is uh, something like another $125,000. So he doubled the prize fund and told Fisher. If it's money you want, here's the money, you know, go play Spassky, you chicken. Uh, and it also took, uh, of course, a phone, phone call from the former uh, Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Henry Kissinger. And uh, although I don't, uh, knowing Fisher, not knowing him personally, but reading a lot about Fisher, I don't think he would be that impressed uh, from getting a call from a Secretary of State. Uh, as uh, Fisher often said that he does not represent the United States, he represents Bobby Fisher, he represents himself. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, in the previous tournaments, in uh, Fisher's previous attempts to, uh, you know, conquer the Chess Olympus, uh, he didn't really get all that much backup from the United States. But here, uh, when they heard about uh, Fisher winning in Buenos Aires against Tigran Petrosian, he even received uh, a letter from President Nixon uh, saying that uh, the United States are backing him up uh, with anything he needs. Uh, so it kind of pretty much all worked out. Uh, uh, Spassky even said that he didn't actually think the match would happen, but he did play his part uh, in trying to m make the match actually happen. So Fischer finally went to Reykjavik, he went to Iceland, and uh, uh, when, when he got there, 
uh, the match uh, was uh, still not being played. The match was again postponed because now uh, Spassky insisted uh, that Fisher should publicly apologize to him for breaking Fide's rules and, uh, you know, being late uh, for the match uh, for so long. Uh, but uh, seemingly, uh, all, all uh, you know, how things worked out and how Fisher managed to get all this money, not the gate prize money, but the money uh, from Mr. Jim Slater, which is basically doubling the price fund, uh, really worked out for him as he did publicly uh, apologize to, uh, to Boris Pasky on American television. And uh, this was the cause of the match being postponed for one more day. So now everything is set in motion. Uh, the match uh, was late for some 11 days, I believe. Uh, Spassky is now in the playing hall. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, Fisher still isn't there. And Spassky looks around. Uh, he's not there. The clocks have been started. Uh, Spassky plays D4. And Fisher still is nowhere to be found. Uh, Spassky was also a big, uh, a big uh, uh, E4 man. For example, in his match against Tigran Petrosen, he did play a lot of E4. Uh, and, uh, you know, in games throughout, he enjoyed E4 very much, but he thought against uh, his American opponent, uh, D4 was definitely the way to go. And some, uh, as, uh, you know, people reported it, uh, nine minutes have passed. Uh, there, Fisher comes to the stage, sits at the board, greets Spassky, and he replies with knight to F6, which is what Fisher usually, usually replies to uh, when faced with D4. And okay, uh, the game starts. We have c4, uh, e6, and knight to f3. Spassky, uh, for now, avoids the Nimzo Indian and uh, uh, offers Fisher the opportunity to go for the Queen's Indian defense. Uh, but Fisher ignores this and, of course, transposed into the Queen's Gambit declined. Uh, we have knight to c3 by Spassky and bishop to b4. Now, again, uh, there might uh, be a Nimzo Indian on the board, and in fact, Spassky does play e3 uh, and goes into this uh, very uh, timid line of the uh, Nimzo Indian defense. But but by this move order, uh, he avoids a lot of uh, very sharp lines that would be would have been available for Black. Uh, on the other hand, uh, instead of this bishop to b4 move, uh, Fisher usually did enjoy to play c5, but we've already seen uh, c5 uh, in uh, Spassky's game against Tigran Petrosen, where he uh, won a very nice game uh, in game 5 uh, in his uh, championship uh, match against uh, Tigran Petrosen. So, bishop to b4, uh, we have e3, avoiding all the scary lines, we have castles by Fischer, and now bishop to d3. And okay, Fischer now goes for c5, and we have castles, and now comes knight to c6. Uh, we have a3 attacking the bishop, and here uh, some of the th this is a well known position uh, in the in Nimzo Indian defense. Uh, moves like bishop captures on c3 or c captures on d4 uh, are quite the usual responses here, but here Fisher actually goes for bishop to a5. And uh, here, this is the first moment in the game where Spassky doesn't reply automatically. Here, Spassky uh, has to think about his reply, so he was not ready for this bishop to a5 move. So it seems that uh, Fisher definitely out-prepared Spassky. Uh, and here, after bishop to a5, we have knight to e2. After some consideration, Spassky plays this knight to e2, and uh, here it was clear, not to Spassky at the, the time he played this move, but uh, to those uh, who <laughs> whose job was uh, to prepare Spassky, uh, knight to e2 is a move Spassky already played 14 years ago against uh, uh, Nikola, Grandmaster Nikolai Krogius. Grandmaster Nikolai Krogius is uh, one of the two Grandmasters uh, that serve as uh, Spassky's second during the championship match with Fischer. Uh, first one being Grandmaster Effing Geller. And uh, this move, like I said, was already played and Fischer knew this because Fischer had this uh, red book of 355 Spassky's games that he probably knew by heart. And uh, in this book, also this uh, game uh, against Nikolai Krogius was present there. In this game, uh, 92 was played and uh, here uh, we have d captures on c4. Uh, d captures on c4, uh, okay, d captures on c4, and we have bishop captures on c4. Uh, bishop to b6, now defending the c5 pawn, and now d captures on c5. Uh, the same as in the game with Nikolai Krogius. Uh, but in that game, bishop captures on c5 was played. Uh, here, uh, Fischer takes a different approach. Queen captures queen, so immediately exchanging queens. Uh, rook captures on d1, and now bishop captures on c5. So, uh, it's only move 12, but Fischer already uh, got the queens off the board, and uh, the, the two, two pawns uh, on, uh, on the queen side for each players, uh, and uh, four pawns uh, on the king side, uh, the material is completely equal. 
Uh, so a pleasant position to have for black against a world champion already on move 12. Uh, b4, attacking Fisher's bishop. Bishop uh, goes back to e7 and now bishop to b2. And here bishop to d7. A very nice move by Fisher. Uh, the, the idea is that at some point this knight will move and then Fisher will use this bishop to a4 move to get a tempo on this rook and uh, develop all of his pieces. Uh, here bishop captures on f6 isn't all that impressive because bishop captures and after rook captures on d7 rook captures uh, bishop captures rook on a1. So black would of course be better here. Uh, so here we have rook a to c1, uh, and now rook f to d8, uh, knight e to d4, knight captures, knight captures, and now comes the bishop to a4, uh, the move we discussed that allows Fischer uh, to activate his pieces. Uh, bishop to b3 uh, by Spassky, a very nice move by Spassky that uh, uh, you have to see that uh, bishop captures on b3 was played in the game, uh, but rook captures on d4 doesn't really do anything for black, uh, because of course you will ignore the rook, you will not capture the rook and allow bishop captures uh, bishop, uh, but you will play bishop captures bishop immediately. And then after rook captures, we have rook captures on d1 and now rook to d8. Uh, rook captures, rook captures, and after white brings back the bishop, uh, you have... Uh, uh, the material is equal on the board, but everyone would prefer the bishop of Bera against uh, the, the bishop and the knight here. Uh, so after bishop to b3, we have bishop captures, uh, knight captures, and now rook captures on d1. Rook captures on d1, and now rook to c8. And here, uh, Fisher says that... Uh, uh, his his rook uh, on the c file is more impressive than Spassky's rook on the d file because Fisher here controls uh, d squares and also the knight controls uh, d7, so there's no way for Sp Spassky to ever infiltrate Fisher's position here. Whereas Spassky only controls c1 and c3, not so much c2. But still, it's not so uh, easy to take uh, advantage of this in any way. Here, king to f1 is played. Uh, you don't really achieve anything with bishop captures on f6, uh, you do remove the defender of the d7 square, but then if you go for this, uh, for example, rook c3. After rook captures, of course, you cannot capture the knight immediately due to the mate threats on the back rank, uh, but then after h5 and white decides to move the rook, you move the, uh, uh, sorry, the knight, you move the knight further back, and only then do you recapture the, uh, the pawn, material is equal. Uh, but perhaps uh, the outside pass pawn will, well, it's not passed just yet, but the outside pawn perhaps will be a bit more meaningful, uh, and it, it is a knight against, uh, a bishop against a knight. Uh, so, simply improving the position of the king. King to f1. Uh, Fisher does the same, king to f8, and uh, it, the idea is similar. Fisher can't infiltrate immediately via rook to c2, because now bishop captures, and now after g captures, you get this rook to d7 again with, with some threats here. Uh, so, Fisher improves the position of his king, king to f8, we have king to e2, uh, Spassky improves the position of the king even further, and now knight to e4. Uh, already, if white uh, is, you know, not, not so careful, for example, if something like h4, a silly move is played, then rook to c2, this is the threat, uh, this would win the game, it's check, uh, you're gonna lose the bishop, and if you try to attack the knight, then even f5 with ideas of capturing an f2 uh, with checkmate are possible. Uh, so, after knight to e4, Rook to c1, simply countering Fisher's rook on the c file, and now we have rook captures on c1. Uh, bishop captures on c1, and now f6. Uh, we have knight to a5, and now knight to d6. Uh, knight to d6 is a much needed move, you you don't want to push your pawns. Uh, once you push a pawn, you can never unpush it, and here uh, white would simply use this as an opportunity to further attack your pawns. For example, a6, knight to b8, now you further attack the pawn, a5, now you can even further attack it, for example, captures, captures, and knight to c6, and now there's really no way to protect it, you have to push it to a light square, now that it's in a light square your bishop can no longer protect it, and white would, well, after kicking away the knight, would easily pick up this pawn. So after knight to a5, uh, we have knight to d6, uh, guarding the pawn, and now comes king to d3. Bishop to d8, forcing the knight back, uh, knight to c4, uh, c4 uh, and now bishop to c7. Uh, we have bishop ca knight captures, bishop captures, and now b6. Uh, a great move as uh, Fisher has a dark square bishop, you don't want your pawns on dark squares, uh, at some point Spassky will even push a4 and connect uh, uh, the pawns on light squares on the, on the queen side. Uh, and uh, this is the critical moment uh, in the game and the most critical moment in any game of any world chess championship that was ever played, uh, this is unimaginable, this is... Uh, 
probably the worst uh, the worst uh, blunder Fisher uh, made in his entire career. Uh, here you can pretty much sense that the position is completely drawn, but here uh, after not so much consideration, uh, I mean for for playing such a move you would have to uh, calculate it perfectly, but Fisher just played bishop captures on h2. And uh, when everyone saw this, because <clears throat> uh, it's very interesting, uh, I, I forget to I forgot to mention this because uh, there are so many things about uh, <laughs> you you could talk about here about this match, uh, but uh, the, the the last uh, ten World Chess Championship matches were actually uh, played uh, in Moscow as uh, all of the contenders were Soviet chess players, and uh, here when uh, for the first time you have some someone else uh, contending for the title this time an American Bobby Fischer, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Reykjavik doesn't have any experience organizing such matches, so they pretty much took everything from the Soviets, but instead of the big demonstration boards, uh, they have a, clo a closed circuit television. So they had a lot of monitors uh, placed everywhere and uh, people in the back uh, even had uh, headphones where they could listen to some commentary. Uh, and uh, when, <laughs> when this was played, uh, a couple of thousands, thousand people were like completely baffled and grandmasters who were watching this uh, no one knew what was happening when Fisher captured this I mean uh, of course uh, every every child knows that you don't capture this because g3 traps the bishop uh, but when Fisher plays it in a world chess championship match then it, it's like you you do kind of have to question everything you know about chess is this winning for black is this why why, why would Fisher do this in a completely drawn position uh, so it didn't take Spassky all that uh, much time to reply. Uh, he simply played g3, which is what everyone would play, and now everyone was, okay, what now? And okay, Fischer continued, h5, we have king to e2, uh, h4, king to f3, and now uh, after king came to f3, uh, they say that Fischer <laughs> saw this and realized that... Uh, uh, perhaps he 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 might have missed something. Uh, here we have uh, a nice photo of uh, of uh, this moment. It's not from this moment. Might not even be from this game. Uh, the the position on the board does somewhat uh, uh, seem like a position that would be similar from a later position. But regardless, it's just something to get you in the mood. Uh, you know, completely disregard the position on the board. Uh, but yeah, here Fisher figured out that he probably uh, missed something. So okay, king to e7 was played. Uh, we have king to e7, and now king to g2. As the bishop is trapped, uh, this is this is well known. Uh, h captures on g3. Uh, we have f captures on g3. Bishop captures, king captures, and now king to d6. So uh, are two pawns compensation enough for Spassky's extra piece? Uh, a4. This is definitely the best idea. Uh, okay, uh, uh, connecting his pawns and also preparing a bishop to a3. If you played something like king to f3 to start improving the position of your king, then after king to c5, uh, threatening to capture this, it's uh, uh, white, uh, black would uh, have at least uh, a drawn endgame uh, because now you can start grabbing pawns on the queen side. Uh, so after king to d6, a4, Spassky goes for the best idea. Uh, we have king to d5. Uh, and now bishop to a3. Again, the best move. Uh, simply controlling the dark squares on the queen side. Uh, again, if you tried something like uh, instead of bishop to a3, uh, king to f3 again, then king to c4 uh, would have been uh, enough for black. For example, bishop to a3, but now b6. Uh, bishop goes back, now comes uh, g6. Uh, king goes to e4, now comes king to b b3. Bishop to e7, attacking f6, now comes king captures on a4. Bishop captures on f6, and now king captures uh, on b5, and now you have two connected pass pawns on the queen side. Uh, it's not, uh, white can't really do all that much with, with one pawn. King e5, simply king c4, king captures, now comes king d3, attacking the pawn. Bishop d4 defending, and now king to e4. The king is on a light square, and now there's nothing that can push this king uh, off of his light square. And now, uh, after... Black simply pushes all of his pawns. At some point, uh, White Bishop will have to move uh, from <laughs> from the pawn, and then King captures. Uh, now the game is a draw. Uh, so after King d5, Bishop to a3, strongest reply by Spassky. We have King to e4, and now Bishop to c5. Uh, we have a6, and now b6. Uh, Spassky has to keep as many pawns on the board as possible if he wants to allow uh, for winning chances later. Uh, f5. Uh, we have king to h4, the correct idea. 
Uh, and here Fisher plays f4 and uh, everyone agreed that after this move uh, all of the drawing chances were gone uh, because now uh, the two pass pawns Fisher will have on the king side will simply not be all that impressive. So okay, e captures on f4, we have uh, king captures on f4 uh, and here king to h5. Uh, forgot to mention uh, after this f4 move uh, Spassky decided uh, to... Uh, uh, take the game into a German, uh, he decided to seal his 41st move. I was uh, pretty obvious uh, which his uh, 41st move will be, uh, so it wasn't uh, like a surprise or anything, uh, but he had to waste 25 minutes on, uh, on the clock of his own time uh, to seal the move here and uh, continue the game tomorrow during a German, uh, but uh, you know it was, it was well worth it because better do it now and then find a winning game at home. So uh, here the game was adjourned, it was continued tomorrow, uh, and uh, of course this was played, but that was not uh, that much of a surprise. King captures on f4 and now king to h5. This is the move, uh, of course, uh, they had to find, this is the winning idea. The king now has to, sorry about that, the king has to travel all this way and gra start uh, grabbing all of these pawns on the queen side. And uh, the dark square bishop uh, will simply move back and forth and keep an eye on the b6 pawn, because the b6 pawn uh, is the winning pawn in this game. Uh, or will be. Uh, king to f5, uh, Fischer doesn't allow Spassky to enter uh, the, the queen side, uh, bishop to e3 and now king to e4 attacking the bishop. Uh, bishop comes to f2, now comes king to f5 uh, and bishop to h4 now. And now uh, the black king is in Zugzwang. Uh, you have to move uh, you, you have to move at least one pawn. If you move the king, for example king e5, uh, then you allow uh, Spassky's king to start uh, approaching the b7 pawn. So here uh, you're really uh, without uh, any options, e5 was played. And okay, now comes the bishop to g5. Uh, we have e4 and now bishop to e3, uh, again with the idea of put, putting black in, uh, in, in Tsugtsuang. Uh, so you have to move the king and now comes king to g4. The white king is out of his prison. Uh, king to e5, now comes king to g5 and now king to d5. Uh, king to f5 is played, king to a, uh, uh, Fischer uh, pushes a5, uh, bishop to f2 and now g5. Fischer gives up one more pawn to at least uh, displace the white king for a moment. King captures and now he goes for the queen side pawns. But the problem is you can never capture the b6 pawn. Uh, king to f5 was played, now comes king to b4. King captures on e4, king to a4, capturing a pawn, we have king to d5. We have king to b5, and here after Spassky played king to d6, uh, it was in this position that uh, Bobby Fischer resigned the game uh, on move 56. Uh, why did he resign? Uh, well, whatever he does, he can never capture the b6 pawn, and Spassky will simply capture the b7 pawn. For example, he can start pushing his own pass pawn. Uh, Spassky will simply keep an eye on it uh, with the bishop. After the bishop is attacked, you will simply move it, uh, and when... Fischer starts pushing his pass pawn, you will simply attack the b7 pawn, capture the pawn, move the king, and then queen the b pawn, while black can never queen the a pawn. Uh, so yeah, after king to d6, uh, after all this drama and, uh, you know, it took months of <laughs> months of preparing and uh, psychological warfare uh, to even get this match started, and it took a lot of people to even make it happen from, <laughs> from FIDE president Max Juve to... Uh, as, you've, uh, as you've heard, Henry Kissinger, uh, Jim Slater here, who offered the money, uh, like everyone, everyone, and uh, uh, not the greatest start uh, to the match by Bobby Fischer. Uh, it was a, it, it's hard to imagine why would you do such a move. I mean, you have the black pieces. You've pretty much uh, uh, came on top. You you you've shown you've came more prepared than the world champion. Uh, you already had a. A completely drawn position on the board by move 12. You could have easily drawn it and then next game you have the white pieces. Uh, but uh, Fischer decided to grab the h2 pawn and lose the game. So very, very, very interesting turn of events. And uh, I'm sure uh, there, there's so much you can say about this match. Like uh, I've already read two books, now I'm reading the third book about this match. And in every book there, there are more interesting informations uh, there's more interesting information on on the entire match uh so i do recommend to everyone to check out uh, any book on this match uh, yeah, i'm sure you'll enjoy it there's just no way to say everything about it in one video uh but if i've missed anything like really important there are still more games to come in this match so we're gonna cover that as well 
So that's the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Fred Ackerman, Jason Bertram, Robert Arathun, uh, Carl Martin and Joshua Kulpa for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching and uh, I will see you soon uh, with uh, another game from the Fisher's Pusky series from the whole Bobby Fisher story. Uh, and perhaps uh, the Batumi Chess Olympiad is running tomorrow. We'll see uh, how things uh, uh, go there. Uh, so thank you all and I'll see you soon.